So now it's uh, my turn to talk to you about uh, how we use central, uh, how we use ultrasound to guide central neuroaxial blockade. And this is uh, primarily focused on the lumbar spine, but we will talk a little bit about the thoracic spine. And essentially, this is how to use, uh, use it for your spinals and your epidurals. We do this quite often in Toronto Western. We found it to be a very, very valuable technique. So the things that we're going to talk about today, I'm going to show you why you should consider um, making ultrasound part of your practice in central interaxial blockade. We're again going to run through the sonar anatomy of the lumbar spine because it's very important to uh, appreciate that in order to make sense of what you're seeing. And then we'll talk about actually how you use those images to, to do the blocks. And along the way, I'll give you some clinical pearls about um, dealing with the challenging patients. So why use ultrasound at all? It's really easy. It facilitates the technical performance of our central interaxial blockade. It makes our day go a lot easier when we have those difficult patients. And it is important for patient comfort as well as safety. There's good evidence from uh, large observational studies of complications that when you do encounter technical difficulty, it raises the risk of various things like spinal hematomas as well as neurological deficit. And those are two perhaps of the most uh, devastating complications that we can have with central neuroaxial blockade. There is relatively good evidence now that ultrasound does indeed reduce technical difficulty. As any of you who are familiar with literature will know, Thomas Grau led the way as early as 2001. Um, and although his were early single operator studies, the work that's been done since by both ourselves as well as um, by Vallejo and Al, they've been very consistent in showing that ultrasound in general will halve the number of needle passes required for successful spinal or epidural anesthesia. The reason it's becoming so pertinent today is because certainly in North American and I would say European practice, these are the kind of patients that are showing up more and more often, especially for total joint replacement surgery where you know, spinals and uh, um, epidurals are a preferred method of anesthesia. We have obese patients, we have old patients with degenerative spine and degenerative scoliosis, and a lot of patients have come to us with chronic back pain and chronic back surgery. Um, uh, for which they've subsequently worn out their hips or knees. And once again, we have shown now that ultrasound is particularly useful in these patients. There are numerous case reports of this. Again, Thomas Grau, way ahead of his time in 2001, studied obstetric patients who had spinal deformity or history of difficulty. Once again, showed that uh, ultrasound made it much easier. And we ourselves have shown that even when compared to experienced practitioners using the surface landmark guided technique, the application of ultrasound more than half the number of needle passes and reduced the time required to perform the spinal anesthetic. Interestingly enough, apart from reducing te technical difficulty, there's evidence that when it comes to epidurals, you can perhaps improve the efficacy of your epidural. Thomas Grau again, um, 300 labor epidurals, showed that there was a lower rate of incomplete analgesia, quite significantly so, and um, also perhaps even better pain control. The validation of this really came with this study um, in which 15 first-year anesthesiology trainees did the epidurals, guided by an ultrasound that was performed by an experienced operator. And the most telling result here was that Epidural failure, which they, they defined as the need to replace the epidural, was dramatically reduced if ultrasound was used. So I would argue that there's more to it than just reducing needle passes. Let's turn now to look at the sonar anatomy of the spine. And you've already heard this in various fashions, but I'd like to go through it again in a, in a systematic way so that you, you get a good understanding. These are the planes of imaging that we currently used most commonly when we're trying to do um, central neuroaxial blockade. The probe is either placed in a paramedian sagittal or paramedian sagittal oblique plane where it is angled towards the midline, or we turn it into a transverse orientation. If we start from lateral to medial, um, the first structure you can visualize in the spine with the paramedian sagittal view is the transverse process. And so here, the beam is well out lateral, 
and we're cutting the transverse process. And if you I draw your attention to that MRI image there, you'll see that what you're getting is the uh, transverse processes in cross-section. However, because they're a bone, what they appear like are these finger-like shadows um, with a hyperechoic, um, excuse me, with a hyperechoic uh, tip above them. And uh, if you see three of them, that's called the trident sign. This was the image you saw in the last presentation by Manoj uh, for the source compartment block. If you then slide the probe more medially, the next structure that you're going to come over are the articular processes and the facet joints. And now we have overlapping superior and inferior articular processes. Gives you a complete line of bone, and thus, instead of uh, seeing the intervening psoas muscle, what you get is this continuous wavy hyperechoic line. It's not particularly useful in itself, but it sets us up for the next view, um, which is the one that gives us the view of the vertebral canal. So once you've obtained the uh, facet joint view or the articular process view, don't slide your probe any further, but rather just angle it towards the midline, and you should find your beam being directed through the paramedian interlaminar space. What you now get is that you are cutting the lamina um, in cross-section, and the lamina in the lumbar area slopes downwards from cordet to cephalet and gives you this characteristic sawtooth appearance. You get these dropout shadows that look like the teeth of a saw, and if you look in between these teeth, what we'll be looking at is the anterior wall of the vertebral canal, which is formed, and we get this complex shadow, which we've called the anterior complex, and it's a complex of dura, posterior longitudinal ligament, and the posterior vertebral body or intervertebral disc. Again, Bernard has shown you that if you then take your attention up to the posterior aspect of the canal, you'll see a hyperechoic structure, which occasionally you can differentiate into ligamentum flavor mandura. But as you'll see here, you won't see it in in all the views, and you'll have to do some tilting and adjusting if you want to get this kind of view where you get the two little hyperechoic lines. It's not strictly necessary, though, and in some patients, it's not possible. If you then turn your probe into the transverse view, we're going to see one of two things. Either we're going to see the spinous process, and this is what it looks like. Remember, the spinous process and the lamina are again a bone. So as your beam goes through, you're actually not going to see anything. You're going to see the white shadows where it reflects off the bone, and thereafter a black dropout shadow beneath. When you have this view, though, it does tell you two things. It tells you where the spinous process and therefore the midline is, but it also tells you now if you slide your probe, cephalet or cordet up or down, you should come into the interlaminar interspinous process. And now this is what we see. We no longer have laminar or spinous process in the way. We do have the interspinous and uh, supraspinous ligaments, which do cast an acoustic shadow, but we can actually see all the way down to the soft tissue structures of the vertebral canal. And that's the ligamentum flavum as well as the dura. And this is the appearance that you get. Now, instead of having this black dropout shadow, you see two white lines uh, appear, in, in the, uh, appear out of the darkness. And the best description of this so far that I've come across is called the smile sign because it looks like you know, two lips smiling and it's certainly what appears on my face when I get this image in a patient. You also see the uh, articular processes and the facet joints out to the sides as well as the transverse process and hence this was uh, also been described as the bat sign with these being the ears of the bat and the transverse processes being the wings. They are useful landmarks when these lines are indistinct because you know that if you see the articular processes or the transverse processes, you're pretty close to where you should be for the interlaminar space. So I sometimes look for that if I'm having trouble getting that smile sign. And once again, the bottom line, which is your most obvious landmark, is the anterior complex of dura, uh, PLL, and vertebral body. The intrathecal space is the black space above, and I must point out to you that ligamentum flavor mandura in the transverse view is sometimes not very visible, and I think that's due to the attenuation from all these ligaments. What you always do see, though, quite consistently will be the anterior complex. So sometimes you won't see those two lines, but you should expect to see this single line low down below the um, articular processes. So how do we use this? The first thing we can do is identify our vertebral levels and count our vertebral levels. And the way we do this is using that pyramid and sagittal oblique view. We start over the sacrum. And when you get the sacrum in view, the first sawtooth you see will be the L5 lamina. And that will be your L5-S1 space. And you can move upwards and count each space in turn. The reason this is important is that 
conus medullaris damage has been described after spinal anesthesia, and it's well known that when we palpate tufius line or the intercrystal line, the accuracy is pretty poor, and we're usually higher than we think we are. And this is because, number one, tufius line, like all things, follows a normal distribution. Although it's centered in L4-5, it can range from 3-4 to 5-S1. And particularly, we found if you're doing older patients, there is always a degree of vertebral collapse. And in those patients particularly, we find that the intercrystal line is at L2-3 or even higher. The other thing to remember is that the conus, although we all have this uh, uh, um, fact of L1-2 being fixed in our mind, again, it follows a normal distribution. And, you know, in one in a hundred patients, uh, it may end as low as L3. So we really don't want to be higher than we need to be. Okay, using it to guide needle insertion. What I tend to use the paramedian satchel oblique for mostly is to identify and mark the interlaminar spaces. So as I described to you, you move cordat till you find the sacrum. You then center each space in turn as so, and you make the corresponding mark on the skin with a, with a marker. Those then give me my guides when I'm doing my transfer scan so that I know which space I'm looking at. And particularly when the spaces are close together, it's very easy to get confused as to whether the one you're seeing now is the L2-3 or is it the L4-5 or perhaps even the L1-2. So those, those previous marks you made become very useful. But essentially when we get the um, transverse interspinous view and in, in our smile sign, we center the midline um, in the probe, we make a corresponding mark, and we make a mark along the, mid the middle of the short edge of the probe. And the intersection of those two lines should give us our in insertion points. And this just shows you here on an actual patient what we've done. We've marked the midline and the transverse uh, midline scan. We've marked uh, where that short edge of the probe was. And we know which spaces they are from the paramedian satchel oblique scan. We extend those lines. They give you a crosshair. So this patient has a tiny bit of scoliosis, hence they don't quite line up. In this case, we've chosen the L2-3 space because we saw it best there, and uh, we've inserted it. Note that I have angled the needle quite carefully. And you may find that you'll have to do that as well. You'll have to angle your probe a little bit carefully to get the best image. And if you have to do that, you should use that same trajectory when you're actually inserting your needle. Remember, however, that it is skin marking, skin is mobile, and there can be inaccuracies in skin marking. So with experience, though, we find that the, you, your accuracy will improve. And if you're particularly um, aware and, and pay attention to whether you're sliding and moving the skin up and down, you can compensate for that too. The, at the end of the day, success here depends on being really meticulous as well as redirecting your needle in small increments. I found particularly that you should be using a stiffer, larger gauge needle in obese patients because of the potential for deflection of your needle. And I just want to illustrate this to you. We've actually been doing some studies in residents to see how well they can use this. And one of the reasons their needle passes uh, have not been necessarily kept to a minimum is because their redirections are, are quite inefficient. You can see that, you know, we want to get into the space here, but being off by a very little bit can make the difference between you contacting bone or contacting uh, lamina rather than getting to the space. And, and, and sometimes the residents struggle with this because their control of the needle insertion is poor. And you can see here the effect of deflection, which I often encounter in obese patients, hence my use of a stiffer 22-gauge needle rather than a long, um, flexible 25-gauge needle. So what do you see when you see obese patients? Because the, the, the ones I've been showing you earlier on are in the, in the perfect patient who you don't really need to use ultrasound in. In obesity, I would argue that you can still appreciate the midline either from the spinous process or this acoustic shadow of the ligaments. So that's one piece of information that you may not have otherwise. However, with experience too, you can recognize the subtle gray lines of the smile sign reflecting the flavum dura and the uh, anterior complex. And from that, you know that you're imaging a um, posterior vertebral space, uh, um, a interspinous space. If you have that information too, you can measure the depth of the vertebral canal, and it's often allowed us to start off with a, a sufficiently long needle rather than using the standard needle and finding that it's not quite long enough to reach. This video is going to show you what it looks like in the deep patient and the subtlety of the signs, but really this is what I tell people to look for. When you're over the spinous process, it's completely black, and as you slide up and down, what you're looking for is those little gray-white lines of the smile to come out of the shadows at you. You see that just there, that's one space. We're going down to the next space, again, black. But you see those white lines, black. You see those white lines. 
Um, and so with experience, it, is, it isn't really that hard to appreciate these subtle, these subtle changes in, in, in the image. We've also found it very useful now for scoliosis patients. Um, and we're not talking about the dramatic scoliosis with the humpbacks. I mean, those, those, it's fairly easy to appreciate how much they rotated. But we get a lot of patients who have subtle degrees of lumbar scoliosis or rotation. And what happens is, you know, often you can palpate the spinous processes, so you put it in over the spinous processes, and in a normal patient, it should go straight into the vertebral canal. If, however, there is a degree of rotation, putting it where you think the midline is is actually going to take you onto the lamina or the facet joint, and, you know, they often will complain of pain that's localized to one side or other, and that gives you your first clue that there is rotation. We found ultrasound very helpful because... What happens is that when we put our ultrasound probe in this patient and, you know, we're normally perpendicular to the skin, instead of seeing this symmetrical image, what happens is that we do get an image, but it looks as though it's rotated. And then what you do, or what we do, is we rotate the probe until we bring this image into a symmetrical position, and that rotation tells us now this is the angle at which we need to put our needle. And this is illustrated very nicely in this particular patient, she, you really look at her, you wouldn't really know she had the degree of scoliosis, but when we scanned her, we did, and you can see it's, it's about a 10-degree angle off to the left, and it's not something that you know, I would take uh, without that prior knowledge of her rotation. Finally, you can put this all together, and you can say to patients who have concerns about spinal anesthesia because of some back issues, or you, know, they're, they're just, they're just, or you want to reassure yourself that uh, they've got some issue um, say a stenosis at a lower level, you want to go above that, you can use it as a preoperative assessment too. And to me, this was illustrated uh, very, very clearly by, by a patient that we subsequently wrote up in 2010. I saw this woman in clinic, and she was 40 years old, had ankylosing spondylitis, was coming for a total hip replacement, and it was her second in uh, three months or six months. And for the first one, because of her ankylosing spondylitis and cervical um, uh, neck issues, they had uh, attempted a spinal, and she basically had it attempted by three of our staff people. She had it attempted by three different approaches, two different levels, multiple needles, all very well documented, uh, and at the end of the day, unsuccessful. And you can see why she's got severe ankylosing uh, disease of, of, of the, the lower joints. Um, they ended up putting her to sleep uh, and using a fiber optic intubation, but she found the whole experience, as you can imagine, uh, rather unpleasant. So when we saw her, she was uh, sort of um, wary about having a similar experience repeated. So what we did was we brought the ultrasound machine down to the clinic and said, let's have a look at your back, uh, because they hadn't used ultrasound there. And interestingly enough, when we scanned her, and this is the paramedian sagittal oblique view, what we could see was that the L2, 3, and um, L3-4 spaces were indeed very narrow. Um, you can see how the lamina almost joins, and there's this bone, and we couldn't actually get a view of the anterior complex in at all. However, once you got down to L4-5, you see how there's a much wider space and there is a little bit shadow of a posterior vertebral body here. And that suggested that that space was open. And again, when we imaged in the transverse view, we couldn't get a picture of the canal. We couldn't get our smile sign. We couldn't get the posterior vertebral body. But once we got to the L4-5 space, we, it was wide open here. And we brought her in, reassuring her that we were going to just try at that level, single pass. We weren't going to put her through a, a big torture, but we were successful on the first pass based on this. And subsequently, you know, we've managed lots of patients who've had concerns about, you know, oh, I've got back issues. I had back pain after the previous epidural. And we said, well, let's, let's have a scan. We'll have one try. We won't torture you. And we've been able to do spinal anesthesia very successfully and in a very, very pleasant fashion for all concerned, including ourselves. I'm going to quickly close up with uh, a little bit on thoracic spine imaging. You've heard from Bernard already that the um, anatomy is quite different. In the, lower lumbar vertebrae, in the lower thoracic region, it's quite similar to the lumbar vertebrae, and you can get similar pictures. Once you get up to the mid-thoracic spine, though, the spinous processes are steeply sloping and their laminae actually overlap. So what that means is you get very small paramedian sagittal oblique windows, and you get basically no transverse uh, windows at all. So the transverse view is really something that we use for thoracic paravertebral blocks, but is of very, very little use at all in central neuraxial blocks. What instead is a little bit useful is, again, the parasagittal oblique view. And here you'll see that you can, again, get a picture of the lamina. And the lamina are slightly different. You notice that they don't slope uh, quite as much. 
but you can appreciate the gap between the lamina as you see here. And uh, this line probably represents where the uh, flavum starts. And in certain individuals, especially if they're young, you do actually get a window through, and this is actually their anterior complex, their posterior vertebral body. So this is the canal and spinal cord that you're looking at. This is likely the posterior dura, the epidural space. But at a minimum, you're always able to see the lamina. You're able to measure the depth to the lamina. You're also able to estimate where that interlaminar space is. So what it tells us then is where the interlaminar space is, how deep it is, where the midline is. And then already that gives you a bit more information to triangulate your, your standard parameter approach to the thoracic spine. And there aren't very many studies to support this at the moment, um, so it's work that is out there to be done for any of you who are, are keen to uh, do that. The last thing I want to touch on, which everybody always asks about, is can I use this and do real-time uh, spinals epidurals? Once again, um, the giant in, uh, in ultrasound guided neuraxial blockade, Thomas Grau, led the way in 2004. He used the parasitical oblique plane, which is what we um, most commonly use too. He, however, put his needle in with the midline technique, and he got somebody else to help him by holding a probe. Um, and nevertheless, he was very successful in doing a real-time ultrasound guided block. Subsequently, Manoj described a in-plane epidural with a single operator, again, with the paramedian sagittal oblique view, bringing his, his needle now in-plane with the beam from cordet to cephalad. And what he did was he used uh, an episure syringe, which is a um, spring-loaded syringe which will uh, depress itself once you encounter loss of resistance. He did this with a patient in the lateral decubitus position. We subsequently published a case report of two patients in which we did um, real-time spinals after the ultrasound-guided spinal failed. And these were patients with extremely narrow spaces. Uh, this particular one was, I think, a 90-year-old lady with severe degenerative uh, spine disease. We did these in the sitting position, and uh, they're a little bit awkward, I have to say, in the sitting position because uh, you're, you're working very close to the surface of the bed, so it's not necessarily the position I would recommend. Subsequently, a report by Lee and all. They did their patients in the prone position, and they targeted the L5-S1 space on the basis that that is the largest uh, space usually in the, uh, lumbar, in the uh, lumbar spine. Uh, and again, they use a stiffer, larger needle, a 22-gauge needle for their spinals, which is something I would recommend too. This is what is in the literature to date, and um, in general, the, the problems are all the same. We have problems with needle visualization because it's steep and deep. Um, you have to be pretty good at your needle alignment because it's a freehand technique. And if you move your probe too much, you lose a view of the canal. So really, alignment uh, is, a, is quite an issue. The ideal position in which you do this to um, is also variable. It seems like the lateral position is the most uh, convenient one, but it often means bringing your needle in um, from uh, top to bottom, and uh, the return of CSF may be a bit sluggish as well. I know um, the group in Sunnybrook led by Paul McCarty have been investigating a, a new technique, um, and if any of you uh, meet him today, you can certainly ask him about it, and we look forward to publications in this area. So in summary, I'm going to say that ultrasound imaging of the spine is certainly feasible, especially with our current technology, and it definitely provides useful information that will help us with uh, spinals and epidurals. It's quite clear that once you get experience in this, it will reduce your technical difficulty. And intriguingly, there is evidence that your clinical efficacy, especially of epidurals, may be improved. And certainly, I would recommend that if you have any patient in whom you're doubting whether you're, you, you want to attempt a spinal epidural, pick up that ultrasound probe, have a look at their spine. If you see a space, you're likely to be able to do this with uh, very, very little issues. What we need, though, is more work into where it fits in in the thoracic spine and whether it helps thoracic epidurals, and perhaps further investigation into real-time ultrasound-guided techniques. Thank you.